Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. Uh, we're continuing our study of the book of Galatians, and tonight we are on verse 24 in chapter 5. So get your Bibles ready, and we'll start in just a second. Let's uh, say hello to the congregation first. Let's start with that untwisted sister, Sister Renee. Hey there, beloved saints. I'm looking forward to this study. Although, um, Book of Galatians is not really that long of a book. It's uh, one of my favorite. So I'm looking forward to this. Amen. Okay, Brother Cripps, what do you have to say to the congregation? Uh, hello, I also am looking forward to it. And um, I loved uh, the end, especially the end of last week, we talked about the fruits. Uh, three, three more verses in this uh, chapter to go, and excited about the next one as well. I'm sure it'll be uh, good for everyone. And I'd say hello to everyone in the chat. And it seems like this past week went by pretty quick, so I'm glad it's here. Bible study time. <laughs> I almost said fun fellowship Bible study. <laughs> we, I, uh, we do have a lot of fun on Wednesday, but it's not really focused on that. This, this is supposed to be a more serious. Uh, uh scenario here yeah a little bit more a little bit more serious <laughs> it's hard for us to be really completely serious though i think um all right so uh hello everybody in the chat room thanks for being with us let's get started uh, we'll go to uh the king james version uh verse 24 says and oh ben i forgot to ask you to say hello to everybody Hey, hello everyone. It's good to be here. I'm looking forward to the study. Uh, finishing up this book tonight, uh, likely. Um, but if it, if we don't, that's okay too. We can savor it. So uh, I, this is one of my favorite epistles as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, coming towards end and kind of wrapping it up. Yeah, I like that that word. We can savor it. Uh, th I would say that this book would be classified as savory. You know, you have the different classes of foods. This is definitely savory stuff in Galatians. All right, verse 24 in the KJ reads, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Sister Renee, maybe you need, you need to give us some context. Yeah, I love this. Okay, I have heard Lordship Salvation has used this and make this a conditional verse when it's actually a statement of fact about a truth about born again believers so uh we see here paul is trying to tell them no you don't need to be circumcised we are the circumcision who worship god in spirit and truth we're the ones they're the true circumcised we're circumcised of heart because we trust in the living god through faith in jesus right and that works of the law can't save as a matter of fact it only stirs up sin and the only thing the holy spirit if you're walking in the spirit gives us are things that are not against the law so there's no point for the law that's the the whole point here and so he, he says you know if you're walking in flesh these are the wicked things that you're gonna produce but if you're walking in spirit it's meekness temperance etc there is no law so we don't need a law because that's what you produce if you walk in the spirit and this is a statement of fact and they that are christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. So it's not something that we've done. It's that when we trusted Christ, we died with him. That's why it says that we were crucified with Christ. We died with him. So what he's trying to say here is that your flesh has already died. And that includes the lust of it. So you should reckon that old man dead because he already died. And we're, we're living alive, walking a new in life, resurrected in newness of life with Jesus. And so a lot of people try to take these verses and say, see, if you're really Christ, you crucified your flesh. You don't walk in it. That's not what it's saying. Paul is encouraging them that they already died. And so they should acknowledge that in their mind so they can get victory and walk in victory without the law and its condemnation. That's the purpose of the statement. Mm, awesome. That's 
Beautifully said, sister. Uh, all right, Brother Cripps, uh, let me read that in the Amplified. Uh, verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature together with its passions and appetites. Yeah, well, Renee did a great job. I don't know that I can add much to it. I'll just say that I, I completely agree. And we've used this analogy, or I have at least used an analogy about the, uh, we still have to carry the, the physical flesh around with us because we just don't have the the eternal state yet. Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's very, very true that um, we have crucified, we have crucified the flesh. I think Paul's right, but that, I'm sure you'll be glad I agree with him. Um, like I said, even though we still carry this around with us, we don't have to walk in the flesh. I think Ray, Ray pointed that out, that um, we, we can make a decision every day to walk in the spirit. Uh, we, we still have those same tendencies um, and I think the more we mature, the more uh, the Holy Spirit changes us and, and conforms us to the likeness of Christ, uh, the less we uh, fall fall through with the flesh stuff. I like that Renee said that, um, I forget how exactly she phrased it, but Paul was saying that that uh, you don't have to give in to these uh, things anymore. Uh, I, I think I botched that, Renee. I didn't say it exactly like you said it. I, uh, I, I got the the nature of it rather than the actual phrase that you used. Oh, you got it. That's all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, I guess there's not a lot to expound on the point. The right. It's really very uh, clear. And I think both of you expressed it uh, just right. Uh, I'm looking at it in the amplified here. I'm not, not, not the amplified. I'm looking at it in the Young's literal verse 24. It says, and those who are Christ, the flesh did crucify with the affections and the desires. So the, the literal translation is that the flesh did crucify. So in other words, the flesh has been crucified. It's done. Everybody, and that's universal. Every person who's been born again has had the flesh crucified. But does that mean <laughs> that, that because our flesh is crucified, and because our spirit is regenerated and we're sealed until the day of redemption, none of those things uh, does it follow that we're necessarily all going to grow and mature and be productive, beautiful, ideal uh, Christians, uh, great ambassadors and examples. Uh, uh, that's not uh, a certainty. Um, but once a person has believed and they are their spirits brought to life and the Holy Spirit starts to work on them and transform them uh, and they have been crucified, then uh, we all do grow mature. But it, the rate and height of our maturity is unique. Mm. We're not, it's not a universal thing where however you think you're maturing, that everybody has to do it at the same rate that you've done it. Some people do it much better than you. Some people don't do it very well at all. Right. Uh, so let's not judge other people. Let's not read more into this than there is. Yeah. Uh, yeah all, oh, what's that? I, I was going to say a lot of people use that to condemn people and then have them look at, well, am I really saved? Because I still got this issue. Does that mean I'm not really saved? And so then they start looking at themselves and their spiritual maturity or whatever issues they have for evidence of their salvation. And that's yeah. what's helping us get it wrong. Yeah. No wonder, because we have so many preachers out there that preach like that. I know. Oh, if you're in the yeah. sin of such and such, oh, the such and such means you're not saved. Like what? Yep. yep. That's true. What, what makes you not saved is you don't really believe. That's yep. what makes you not saved. And our security of our salvation is God's promise, yeah. not, not not us. And so the, these verses can be a stumbling block for people. Yeah, It, it can uh, be twisted often by mm -hmm. preachers to condemn rather than edify because Paul's motive here is to edify and tell them there's no purpose for the Old Testament law because you have the spirit. Yeah. The law stirs up sin. But if you have the spirit, it's only going to produce these good things. And there's no law against the good things the Holy Spirit produces. Yeah. So there's no reason or purpose for the Mosaic law under the new covenant because 
our flesh has been crucified. And if you can get that in your head and know that you are a new creature in Christ, then you can start to walk that out. It's just to encourage, not to condemn. Amen. And I want to comment on something that uh, Brother Luke, Luke said um, I, that I completely agree with as well. Um, judging other people, what level of, of spiritual growth that they're in. Um, I think I think we can't do that. And I've even made the point, you may disagree with this, but I believe that God even has a different relationship with each one of his children. I mean, I know earthly fathers that have several children and he doesn't have the exact same relationship with each one of them. He uh, relates to them in, in the way that each of them is, um, uh, there are certain personalities and, and the way that they handle things. You have, you, you might have a son that, that uh, you have to be uh, more hard on or, or, or chasing in a different way. You have a daughter that wants to do everything right. And, and tries to, and she very rarely has to has to be um, uh, punished or talked to in any way. And the that relationship is different. And I think it, I believe this, and I don't think I can be convinced otherwise that it's the same with us. So if you're looking at someone else's relationship with God or their particular growth, and you're uh, putting that on yourself, I think that's a real mistake. You have to know that your growth is between you and God, and it's no one else's business. And if someone is accusing you uh, of not growing enough or, or you're not uh, representing enough fruit or whatever, um, they need to take a uh, short walk off or no, what is it? A, a long, walk off, long walk off a short pier, I think is what the phrase is. Amen, Cribs yeah. and Luke on that point. Amen. Amen. I didn't hear what you said, Ray. I said amen on both of your points there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, well, Cribs, uh, that is a unique idea you just presented. I've never heard that. It's very interesting. And it uh, sounds uh, like it may very well may be the case. Uh, I could imagine that uh, rather than us all having to adjust to God, right? God is, is, is uh, so loving that he will adjust to each of us. Mm -hmm. We're all unique. So yeah. his relationship is going to be based upon our unique uh, qualities mm -hmm. and he'll be the, the kind of a father that uh, that is right for us. Right. And he knows us better than we know ourselves. He created us. So he 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 knows things about us that we don't know. That's that's the amazing part to me is, is how much he how well he knows us. Mm hmm. Yeah. The. Um, you know, the, the uh, let's say the agnostic and the atheist, uh, the, the, the secular they um, they don't really know much Bible normally, but there are a couple of verses that they all know. And I think maybe their favorite is judge not lest ye be judged, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's a lot of street preachers I've worked with in the past that that's their message. That's their, their message is judging and you're drinking, you're smoking, you're, you're in Sin City. What are you going to do tonight? And all that's, that's it's clearly they're, they're, judging everybody yeah. so that's the reaction that we get but um jesus did teach about judging i mean we are supposed to make righteous judgment and we are should have especially with the help of the holy spirit be able to discern and make good judgments uh but to um uh it's better off i remember that verse uh, i think it's uh first crips chapter one it says <laughs> mind, your, mind your own business <laughs> I, I think i read that in your first book crips that's right okay mind your own business yeah come on i mean really uh if people would be a lot less concerned with everybody else's uh, of all the details and you know, then and then we need to make these judgments about whether they got saved or whether they're all these different things that you you know you've you've either done it or you've heard it <laughs> so you're either uh, you're either guilty for doing it or guilty for, uh, con, uh, what's it, what, what is it called when you go along with something and you don't capitulate. Know, what's that? Capitulate is one, one word that we use for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it is important for us to, uh, let, let's, let's back off on that. Let's focus on Jesus. And, uh, when it comes to others, uh, let's test them. Uh, are you certain you're going to go to heaven and why? Uh, and if we get the right answer, um, that the, the the judgment should end right there. Uh, we just that's how we judge whether someone is a believer or not. Their their confession of 
their their, their certainty of uh, salvation and their and and based on Jesus and nothing uh, nothing from them themselves. Yeah. Um, all right. I guess we'll go to the next uh, verse. Uh, Verse 25, uh, Cripps, this is yours uh, in the KJV. It says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Well, there it is. <laughs> I don't need the Amplified for this one. I just kind of made this point. So, or, well, Renee made the point uh, to begin with. I just added to it. But uh, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Yeah, so uh, our dead spirit, our dead zombie spirit is quickened by the Holy Spirit and made alive when we when we truly believe. And I don't mean a, a superficial belief, but uh, we really, really believe it. And how is that determined? Well, the Holy Spirit will uh, confirm with your spirit that you're his, that you're saved, that you're uh, a son or a daughter. I, I believe that firmly. Uh, uh Satan can deceive people into thinking that they're saved, but if it's a genuine belief, uh, when that doubt comes creeping in, fiery doubts, dark, uh, fiery darts come, you'll have that Holy Spirit that comes alongside you and says, brother, sister, you're, you're my son. Uh, and he doesn't withhold that from his children at all. Uh, so there's no need to struggle with that at all. Uh, so once you know that you have that spirit, you, that, that spirit is alive in you, it's, it's no longer dead then uh, we have the choice to walk in the spirit. And as I've said before, and a lot, I'm sure a lot of people agree, disagree with this as well, and that's okay, that uh, our spirit never sins. That, that, uh, that spirit that's quickened, that's made alive is perfect. God sees it as perfect. He sees that part as uh, the part of us that doesn't sin. And then we, because we still carry the flesh around, we have to choose to walk in it. We have to choose and to walk in that spirit that's married between uh, the spirit God gives us and his spirit. And we have to listen to that, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit that's helping direct us. It's like the, the forgive the analogy, but it's like the, the GPS that tells us which way to turn, which way to go, how to go, how fast to travel, whether there's going to be uh, uh, potholes and, and cops sitting behind a sign ahead, et cetera. <laughs> it's a little driving analogy. But uh, yeah, if we, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That's, that's awesome. That's what we should be doing. I don't want to miss your point, but you're, you're, okay. Yeah. I said, amen, Cripps and uh, uh, Renee, what do you say? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And so the, again, that whole thing is to encourage believers not to be law focused, but to just walk in the spirit. Because if you walk in the spirit, focusing on Christ's love for you, uh, recognizing that you're already dead, your flesh already died. That's how you get victory not trying to don't do this don't do that did i bear false witness well i can't do this today i can't worship other gods nobody's thinking like that um and uh we're complete in christ so we just need to be christ-centered so here it's if we live in the spirit and all of us who have trusted christ we live in the spirit uh somebody was posting first john uh, three there one born of god does not commit sin the seed of christ is in him and he cannot sin who can? The seed of Christ, right? the spirit, the new man, the one born of God is not this dead flesh. That's right. why we cannot inherit the kingdom. Yep. Flesh and blood is not born of God. So um, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Amen. Uh, Jason said it perfectly. That's every person that is in Christ lives in the spirit. But you can choose to walk after your flesh or whatever motivates you. What mm. you're walking after is what's dragging you. Yes. The spirit's either pulling you or the flesh is pulling you. And mm. you got to, once you're saved, you now have the spirit. You have the direction and the ability to avoid these temptations and recognize them as what they are, destructive. Mm-hmm. So what nobody needs law. That, that's what I, I cannot understand why people can't get this. And, and so many today still write me. Yeah, but you still got to be obedient. Your obedience is not perfect and it will not save you. Stop mm -hmm. trying to rely on your own righteousness. You're, it's the obedience of one that gave us life. 
Jesus's obedience. I, I really wish people could get that. And because we stand on that, it doesn't mean we're telling you to be disobedient. We're telling you to be obedient to the first command. And that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yep. Got to trust in him. So every person that is trusted Christ lives in the spirit. So let us also walk in the spirit, which we all fail. None of us are perfect at no matter how many times these people come in and tell me they stop sinning. They have no idea how much sin resides, uh, resides in sinful flesh. It's called sinful flesh. That's where sin resides. But we're supposed to reckon that it already died. But for the lost, that's all they got. That's why they they what does it say? Those in those in the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Circumcision, food laws, stuff that has to do with earthly and fleshly law keeping. That's mm -hmm. what they mind because that's all they got. And I know that would make a lot of people angry, but that's what scripture is talking about. Minding things of the flesh. It's in reference to earthly ordinances. Yep. That includes, uh, I believe, many false converts that are focused on everyone else's sin. Yep. This brother's sin, this sister's sin, they call it brothers and sisters, but they're not brothers and sisters. They're false converts. And they have a tell because they are continually focused, not on their own sin. Like Renee said, they say, oh, I don't sin. I haven't sinned in 50 years. Lie. Bull hockey. You've sinned even in ways you don't know you've sinned, but you're sinning right now in your pride. But uh, they have a tell, which is they, they are sin-focused, just like Renee said. They are focused on other people's sin. Well, they did this and they did that. No, they're not. You know, they're they they call themselves fruit inspectors, but they need to inspect their own fruit rather than inspecting someone else's fruit. Inspect your own spirit. You know, question yourself and see that you be in the faith. You know, question that first, and then then maybe you can uh, remove the the uh, the speck in your brother's eye in when you have the mote in your eyes. That's a good one. Hmm. Yes. Amen. Uh, mixed, mixed analogies there, probably. Mm -hmm. Mixed metaphors, so to speak. Well, the um, we've we've all heard the gospel uh, or some version of a gospel message uh, in, in ways that we find objectionable that uh, are, are not making it clear that salvation comes to, to those who believe, not those who, you know, surrender their life to Jesus, uh, for example. Yeah. Uh, I've heard people say, though, that, uh, yeah, I, I got saved back back in the day, and that's when I gave my life to Jesus. And No, he, he gave his life for us. Woo! We, don't yeah. give, we don't give our life for that him. <laughs> what he can, what, what can he do with our pet, our, our, pesky uh disastrous life what can you do with that i do think that uh the concept of surrendering over to jesus or to, to god's will uh is uh, a beautiful thing and it is really what we uh want to do and should be doing mm -hmm. but uh it's not the method of salvation it's Amen. Uh, once we have believed and we have the Holy Spirit in, in, in us wants to transform us to renew our minds, change our desires and, and our and our behavior. Uh, once that's happening, then uh, the, the ideal is, yes, let's adopt an attitude that, Lord, I surrender now. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my will over to you. You direct my path. What is yeah. that? What is that verse? Uh, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Yeah, well, now you got the spirit, so he can direct, so you can surrender to something. Until you've trusted Christ, you can say, I surrender my life. You don't have the spirit, so all you're trying to do is keep the law to be saved. That's all you're doing. When you say surrender your life, what you're trying to do in your own flesh is love others where you have no love. Right. Or, or forgive those that persecute, but you can't. So you try to force it because yep. you don't have the spirit. And so that he's so right to point out surrendering your life to Christ cannot even be done until you're saved and have the Holy Spirit. Who are you surrendering to? 
You've got yeah. nothing to surrender to. No other voice to guide. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Uh, and I, I think that everybody will agree that uh, as we uh, do surrender our will over to, to the Lord, uh, it, it's like in the what's called the Lord's Prayer, um, thy will be done, it says. And, and if, if we really can say to God, thy will be done in my life, you take yeah. over, um, that really is the best thing for us. Because we that means that um, the problems that come with sin, because sin brings its own consequences. And, you know, Jesus paid for our sins in terms of our uh, the lake of fire. That's not that we're free from that. We're we're not condemned in that way. But uh, sin, if you want to continue sinning, every sin has, comes along with a, a consequence of it. And uh, you, you go commit adultery, you end up getting divorced and having a broken family, sexually transmitted diseases, you become a drunk when you get, you know, bad health and liver condition and lose your work and lose your family, lose everything because of loving alcohol too much. So, uh, you know, nobody gets away with their sin. Even all those of us who are saved, we don't get away with our sin. It has consequences. So if you will surrender your life and say, Lord, thy will be done in my life and walk in the spirit is what we're talking about. Guess what happens? The problems in your life go away and the blessings pile up. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Amen. Okay, I guess uh, any more before we go to the next verse? No, that's good. All right. Okay, verse uh, 26 in the KJV, Renee, it says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Yeah, we saw a lot of that in the early church where they uh, wanted the better gifts. And Paul tells them there's many members of one body. Actually, uh, there's a great verse that refutes everybody has the gift of tongues and that's how you prove you're saved. Paul even says, does all men have the gift of tongues? No, no, they don't. <laughs> every person's got their own gifts. And Amen. every Amen. member has uh, uh, their own gifts. So we work together as one body. And so if you are one in Christ, how can I envy what you have? Because we're one. Yeah. We're, we're not separate. We're one in Christ and we work as a unit. And so anything that we do for God should be for God's glory and not for vainglory. Right. Not for our own attention. Uh, if we desire spiritual gift, it should be because we want to serve God and glorify him, not for our own uh, glory. Amen. Hmm. Yes. Amen to that. All right, Crips, let me read it in the Amplified. I don't, it's not much different. It says, we must not become conceited, challenging or provoking one another, envying one another. Yeah. I, yeah. I, Renee explained it well. I, I think it, it goes in the same category of what we're saying. Just focus on your own, your own life. Focus on your own walk with God. You don't need to be concerned uh, with anyone else. Just, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, if you're listening to him, the Holy Spirit will tell you what you need to do. Uh, someone else is, is over on the side of you, uh, you know, living their own life with God. Uh, now, uh, having said that, I'm not saying that, if, you know, if you see a, a brother or sister struggling or whatever, that you don't do anything to help them. Um, just that this is saying, I believe, uh, don't, uh, don't hold yourself up. Uh, Paul said it before, don't think of yourself higher than you ought, you know, be concerned about, uh, uh, the, the fruits that you're providing. Um, don't get conceited. I like the way the Amplified puts it. Um, and don't worry about what other people have. And I, uh, before I, uh, end, uh, thank you for saying that, especially about speaking in tongues. So there's, there's a lot of damage out there in, uh, some of the churches that, uh, their whole statement, you might've heard me talk about this, but have you have you received the gift of tongues, or the uh, or have you have you see, received the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Um, that tells people that if if they speak in tongues, they're glow in the dark Christians, and they have something you don't have. And they uh, scripture bad too. It's twisting scripture. It is it is twisting scripture. 
Um, and just to be clear, I'm not saying that uh, tongues isn't real or that there aren't people out there that really have it, but there's also a mock spirit out there that uh, may seem to some uh, like it's a, the, the Holy Spirit uh, when I, I don't think that it is. Uh, but anyway, the point of the, but the point of Paul's verses, uh, I, I believe, you know, don't think too highly of yourself. Don't do things for the wrong reasons. Don't provoke each other and don't envy each other. I think that's clear. Uh, by the way, I want to mention to people, the verse that they use is to say, and you shall know them for they shall speak in other tongues. That was fulfilled on Pentecost when Peter spoke in his own tongue and everybody supernaturally heard their own language, their own tongue. He spoke Aramaic or Hebrew and yep. they heard whatever language they spoke. Amen. It was supernatural. It was literal languages, uh, not gibberish. Yep. There's only one verse that could support speaking in a tongue that no man understands. Right. And that's only to be used between you and God. Amen. Not of others, not that's the only place I could see it if you want to go there with it. Yep. But what I see in these Pentecostal churches, I do not believe is the gift of tongues. You're supposed to have an interpreter, and that meant a language. Yep language if you're spanish and there's a french person there and you need to deliver a message in french uh for some reason god sends it to you in that language you need someone that understands french so that they amen. can tell the church what it means amen. So amen that's what happened back then and now uh when it says you shall know them for uh, you don't want to know what the other uh signs for the jews were that they would raise the dead that that the sick would recover that the cripple would walk they, do you go around uh, raising cripples? I do not. Uh -uh. This was all fulfilled in the apostles and in Jesus. And they're trying to say, pick one of those and say, this is the one that proves it. Yeah. Like, we have the Holy Spirit. The, the proof we have the Holy Spirit is that it bears witness to the truth of who Christ is and what he's done. Yeah. That's it. So that's a really confusing a bunch of mess that they've twisted up and you're right uh, Jason it makes people proud well I speak in tongues you know I was in Pentecostal churches I did all that for yeah. you yeah yeah it's not it's not it's not new to me yeah the fake tongues can be imitated you can hear I, I'm yeah. sorry and I used to uh, and the, the, I probably I had to do it in the Pentecostal church years ago well yeah. I probably I shouldn't have yeah, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I, uh, as a teenager, I used to make fun of it. I mean, I, I could sound like I'm speaking tongues mm -hmm. sure. and I didn't, I don't want to mock God. So I, you know, right. as I matured, I, I, right. I, I quit doing it because I don't want to offend anyone. That wasn't my purpose. Right. Uh, but if it can be imitated uh -huh. and you know that it's not a gift from the spirit, then there's something, there's something wrong there. Right. And we're not saying that it's not possible that God has a, they call it prayer language, right. you know, where it says where no man understands him. He speaketh mysteries. If he speak in an unknown tongue to God, right? No man understands. That's the only verse I can find where somebody speaks to God in an unknown language and nobody else understands him. But the only, only thing I can see for that is a private relationship with God. That's right. it. That's the only place I can see for that. The other types of tongues are literal languages that need interpreters. Yeah. And it, all the tongue means is language, mm -hmm. an actual language. Yep. So it's ridiculous that they're, they're doing that. Plus we're not supposed to do that in front of others. So why would that, I mean, it's just, it's just a mess how they've done that yeah. you know? because the other signs, we don't have them. I'm not raising the dead. Are you raising the dead? I'm not raising the dead. Not yet. No. I'm not saved. No. You know? So. No, fortunately, being saved or not being saved isn't by what fruits God gives you. Because okay. again, you can't take a class on, well, you can, but it, it, you shouldn't be taking a class on how to speak in tongues. And they exist. There are people out there that actually think that not only do they have the gift of tongues, but they can teach you how to do it. To, to me, that's a, that's a real warning right there. I mean, if it's really a gift from God, you can't teach it to someone else. God gives it to you or he doesn't. Same with salvation. You can't make someone else be saved. Either either the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and ears and you're saved, or he doesn't. Right, right. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I uh, must have missed something. I, I didn't uh, get the connection uh, from what we were talking about to the subject of tongues. Could you yeah. tell me what, what, what connects those two things? Desirous of vainglory. It was about the gifts. How oh, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that now. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I, again, I, I'm in agreement with everything said about this con, the, uh, the subject of tongues, but the only thing that I could say that uh, I, I believe is maybe similar to this, that, that is, uh, I believe that uh, I can see support in the Bible. There is a verse, maybe someone can find it real quick because I can't quote it exactly, but it talks about how uh, when we're talking to God, we don't even have to speak, we just groan. Yes, the uh, Holy Spirit's grown in ways that cannot be spoken or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I can understand how uh, uh, in, in uh, my uh, time with God, you know, as I don't even have to say a word. I could just groan, and that I, that happens sometimes. Thank you. To me, yes. Uh, and, and that's um, that's a way of communicating with God without words, mm -hmm. and the, the Spirit understands you. Yes. But, but to uh, mouth the words, um, I just don't. I don't really see the support for it. But as you know, we we know people. We have friends that we love uh, that are that are saved, and yeah. And, and they do it, and I'm not going to challenge that. But no, nope. you know, I don't really um, I see it in the scriptures uh, for us today. I've um, got uh, I've got the verse you wanted, but the other verse that supports you know uh, if somebody speaks to God in a language we don't understand, humans, there is a verse that says that, you know when a man speaketh in an unknown tongue to God, he yeah. speaketh mysteries no man understands him. There right. is that verse, and then. Uh, the one you were talking about, Brother Luke, is likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, yes. but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which yes. cannot be uttered. Now, it, if if they could be uttered, then we would be speaking them. Yeah, we'd utter them. Yeah. So to me, I've actually asked uh, God to pray for me before. Okay, yeah. I don't even know what I'm supposed to pray for. Pray for me because something's wrong. <laughs> Amen. I don't know what's wrong, but I need you to pray for me. Wow, that's a good idea. <laughs> Man, I never thought of that. That's fantastic. Yeah. I hope everybody will, will do that now. Yeah, this this briefly just let me tie it back in when I said earlier that the Holy Spirit, uh, God knows you more than you know ourselves. So this ties into that scripturally, in that, you know, if you're, uh, you're, you're not able to utter you, you have things going on in your heart that you, you can't even uh, translate your own thoughts, but the Holy spirit understands them as Renee just said. Uh, that's because he knows you. He knows us more than we know ourselves. And how can we know ourselves? Like he knows us. He created us. He made us. He knitted us together in our mother's womb. Uh, I, from the foundations of the earth, he knew us. I mean, that's, that's clear. Uh, I, I do believe the closer we get to God, the, the more we know ourselves because it's revealed to us. He reveals to us the things that he wants to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. And then as as we know Christ more, as we know God more, then we know ourselves more too. Okay. Um, I guess we're ready to move to the next uh, chapter, aren't we? Yeah, we're stretching it out, Brother Luke. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say one of the purposes for tongues or other languages was so that every every spoken language could understand the gospel. That was the purpose of it on Pentecost. Yeah. So that every man could understand what Christ had done and receive him. That's and they the did. Of it. Yep. Yeah, That's they up. did. 3,000 of them. That's right. Mm -hmm. I believe if you're sitting on the plane next to someone from uh, another another uh, country and God wants you to witness or, or talk to that person about the gospel, he can give you their language and you don't even know how to speak it. That can happen. I, it's never happened to me, but I, I believe that that'll happen. If God wants someone to be saved while you're next to him, then th they're going to be saved. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Yeah. I've heard of a few instances of that understanding Chinese all of a sudden understanding the Middle Eastern language. There's a, uh, uh, you know, our missionaries learn other languages. Like we got one in Sardinia, they're learning Italian. Why didn't they just pull the magical gifts of tongues out? You right. know, like, I, I, 
there is no uh, precedence for a room full of people in a church making no sense and just babbling. There's nothing for it in scripture. Paul speaks against any kind of uh, confusion like that. Yeah. And I see no place for it. Nothing in scripture for that. Uh, and I am not against if somebody like that one verse could support a language that only you and God understand or only God understands or supernaturally gives you. I am not against that. Right. But what I see in these churches is not biblical. No. This just babbling with 50 people, 100 people. Nobody understands anything they're saying. There's no place for that. Right. Nowhere. Right. Agreed. Okay, I guess we'll move on. But the, the, the last thing about this last verse is that, uh, well, actually, it's the, oh, sorry, jumped ahead to, oh, I'm sorry. Which chapter am I on now? Okay. I jumped ahead to the sixth chapter without realizing it. The uh, Let's say um, envying, no, provoking one another, envying one another. Hmm. Obviously, these things, even if you were in a uh, secular uh, setting, just talking to the world as a whole, everybody should be able to agree that uh, uh, vanity, um, being, provoking others, uh, and, and envying, or as it says in the Amplified, it says, uh, we must not become conceited, challenging or provoking one another, envying one another. I mean, this is so uh, universally agreed to that even probably a Satanist would say, yeah, we could agree to that. <laughs> I don't know much about Satanism, though, Renee. What would you say to that? Would a Satanist even agree to verse 26 that we should do that? A Satanist agree about the not envying? Yeah, maybe no, because there's no sin in the Satanic Church. These oh. things like pride and feeding the flesh, they're good things. You're supposed to give in to them. We're just okay. saying after all. All right, you're right. I stand corrected. Yeah, everything's about what you know. do. Do thou will. You should I, 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 just, I just took my point too far, didn't I? <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But I do think many people in the world, even the non-religious, yeah. let's say, that, that they would agree that, look, it's bad to be conceited and provocative and, and envious. Yeah. These yeah. things are not virtues. Right. Uh, and, but um, these things are part of our nature. So how do you overcome it? You don't. The Holy Spirit will transform you if you surrender. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We're going to the next chapter now. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1 in the KJV. And whose turn is it first this time? Is it? Uh, it's mine. There. Okay. Brother Cripps, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Wow. Wow. All right. So he's starting out the next, uh, next thought here with a bang. This is important. Uh, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. Now we're, we're saying uh, as it comes to sin, you know, we're not, we're not supposed to look at someone else and, and, and be concerned about what they're doing or what they're not doing or what kind of fruits and be fruit inspectors and all that. But now here's a, a, a different thing. So if you're seeing a man uh, overtaken in a fault of some sort, uh, especially someone maybe that's, that, is uh, a babe or someone that uh, isn't as far along as you may be in your understanding of certain things, then Paul's saying that uh, we have a responsibility, I believe, to restore them. And how are we supposed to restore them? Not saying, oh, you're not doing this. You need to do this more. And oh, not not with a, a, a accusatory spirit uh, and, and not from a spirit of, oh, you're better than them in some way. But it says here, spirit of meekness. And also, uh, Paul makes the point, I think, that he understands something about this. Uh, considering thyself, make sure and be careful how you do it, but lest you fall into the same temptation, whatever they're being tempted with, whatever fault that they're in, uh, you know, just guard yourself. And you can do that. I, I mean, 
you you can do it by praying. You can do it by reading the word. You can you can get yourself ready. Uh, we're in a we're in a battle, whether we realize it or not. And Brother Luke understands this. Is you know the the minute you get saved, whether you know it or not, you, you're inscripted into the service of a of a spiritual battle that has gone on since the beginning of time, since sin began. You're part of that war. And uh, you have to be careful and you have to have the right um, armor and you have to have the right tools. And I believe that Paul talks about those in great detail as well, the armor that we're supposed to have and the weapons that we're supposed to have. Uh, so uh, do it in meekness. It's not, not saying that we should just let people flounder. If you see someone struggling, come alongside them and, and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to hopefully use you, but do it in, in the right spirit. That's so important. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, Sister Renee, uh, verse one in chapter six. Yeah, here's the here puts to rest that stupid lie that if you're really saved, you won't habitually sin. Because right. these are the self righteous people saying, "Well, I make mistakes, but you won't willfully sin habitually." How much is habitually? Once every week? Yeah. Once every five minutes? Once every five years? One sin keeps you lost. Mm -hmm. It's not the frequency of sin. It's sin in general. And the only thing that cleanses sin is the blood of Christ. Amen. That is ridiculous when people say, if you're really saved, you won't fall into habit. I know people that have lost something, lost a loved one, fallen into despair and become an alcoholic again. Yeah. Does that mean that they weren't saved? No, they were heartbroken. Yep. You don't think, you think God's going to forsake someone in their deepest despair? No. No. So this is what Paul is saying. If a man be overtaken in a fault, mm -hmm. that is when it overwhelms him. Yep. It, has, it is controlling him now. Ye, which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So if you suffer from the same weakness, if this guy is fallen into alcoholism, but you have a history of being weak around alcohol. You have a problem. You've, you've been known to abuse alcohol. You haven't in a long time. Maybe you're not the one to pull him out of that. Right. Because you need to consider yourself and make sure you don't get taken down instead of pulling him up. Amen. So that's all this verse means. And we should have this attitude with the brethren. We're pulling them out of a destructive situation, not condemning them when they're already broken. Right. You know, we need to help people out of destructive behavior in a spirit of meekness, not not self-righteousness. Right. And this verse speaks loudly about how we should deal with these things. Mm. Mm -mm. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Um, well, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in a sin... You who are spiritual, that is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit, are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, not with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness, keeping a watchful eye on yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Um, I think that uh, you, you both covered that uh, in agreement with this uh, amplified uh, uh translation but uh, uh brother hendricks asked if we could respond to this point he wants us to look at um he says um if a man does that mean anyone not just a brother so let's look at the scripture again now it says in the kjv it says brethren if a man so first of all when it says brethren what does that mean anybody can tell me what so What's general, that save people. Yeah. Generally, generally, yes, that's what it means. Well, it, it'll always mean that unless he, he's talking to, to Jew to Jew. Then it talks about that means brother, fellow Jew. It, and so this is talking about in, throughout this entire book, we see the words brethren and brothers. And, and sometimes uh, some of the translations translated as, as, as I'm saying, as to, the, to save people. You know, that's, that's how they'll translate it. So this is saying to the brethren, listen, believer, if a man, now, when it says a man, is that a believer or a non-believer? 
It's a believer because Paul says, what do we care about those without the church? We, we can't, we don't deal with the sin outside the church. We deal with it inside. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Because I was asking the question, not rhetorically, like I knew the answer. Oh, no. I, I was asking it because I didn't know. I was, uh, no, thank you, sister. Very good. You want to get rid of the sin in the world, you'd have to leave the world. That's what he said. We don't we don't deal with sin outside the brethren. Yeah. We don't deal with, with sinful things within the, the brethren. We don't yeah. we don't care what the outside does. Hendrix, are you listening, brother? You paying attention now? There's your answer. So if a man in this case, um, in the context of the church and the protocols and directions we have, uh, getting the whole context, then you have to conclude that this is telling a believer. Uh, if uh, um, one of your brethren, a man, it could man, just just means person, doesn't mean it can't yeah, be a woman, it could be a woman or a man, but uh, be overtaken in a fault, uh, you who are spiritual. Now, I like what it says in the Amplified about that. It says, you who are spiritual, that is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the spirit. That's mm -hmm. what we've been talking about. Every, all the brethren, and sistren, <laughs> we've got the Holy Spirit inside us forever, and the Spirit is working, trying to change our minds. You know, um, I like what Malcolm Smith says about repentance. Uh, he says, "Repent means uh, exchange your mind." And yep. we always say, "It's change your mind." Yeah, change your mind from thinking you can get saved some other way into thinking you're saved only by Jesus, what Jesus did and promised. Uh, but uh, it also could be understood as exchanging your mind so that you're now you've got the mind of Christ, or the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, transforming your mind so that you're, there's a change of mind, exchanging of your mind. So your mind is in agreement with the mind of God. Brother Luke, you gave a good uh, uh, definition of meekness the other day. So I think Hendricks asked Ben. So either Ben or you, if you could give a definition of what meekness means so the viewers can know. Okay. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, if you're meek, that you are a, it's a, a type of weakness in a person. Right. You're meek. Right. Good point. But, um, but uh, uh, if a person's meek, it means that they are not weak. They, they uh, actually are powerful. They're capable. But they restrain themselves. You hold back your your uh, even though you could let's say respond with crushing authority against uh, against someone, you restrain yourself. That is meekness. That, that's power under restraint. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's a wonderful. Uh, uh, it, so it's kind of like uh, having power, but you be gent you're gentle. Gentleness gentleness is not the same as meekness, but meekness is, a gentleness is a part of meekness. You you are able to be uh, forceful but you instead you're gentle and uh, i don't know uh did, was meekness in the uh in the the verse somewhere why is that did that come up anyway it's restore such one in the spirit of meekness okay all right yes all right i see it now in the kjv um or restore some this sort of gentleness, not with a sense of superiority or self righteousness. Uh, unfortunately, that, that happens all too often, uh, where people uh, they are uh, they got their uh, judgment uh, glasses on, and they're looking putting everybody under a microscope. Uh, they're fault finders, uh, and, and uh, they want to uh, strain gnats and find some mistake. Either your theology's off. Or your uh, your behaviors off, but they're looking and they're searching to find something wrong with you, and and, and why? Not because they're concerned and care about you and want to help you uh, with a problem, but because so they can gloat it over you and feel superior and self righteous. That's what this is saying here. That that should not be your motive. It yep. must not be self righteousness to, to make yourself superior. Right. But finally, it says, keep a watchful eye on yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Because as you deal with these problems, remember, you're, you, you, you might be dealing with helping one person by going into a, an environment that's just full of sin and temptation. Yep. Like let's say a friend of yours is, is on crack and an alcoholic and they go to a place where everybody's taking drugs and, and they're all uh, trading sexual favors for drugs and, and that's where your friend is and you got to go and try to get them out of there to help them. Well, you're walking into an area that might be a temptation to you. 
Yep. Amen. Brother, Amen. I wanted to mention what had happened in a church a long time ago. There's a lifelong brother and he made a mistake. Well, the church found out about it. And one of the parishioners, now he repented of it. It was taken care of. It was a bad sexual sin, but it was it was taken care of. And everybody, including the pastor, restored him. We, we, we welcomed him back. But this one parishioner said, what are you doing here? You're not a real Christian. You're this, you're a sinner or something. You know, that guy never came back. But he's a lifelong Christian. Had he not been a lifelong Christian, it really may have turned him away. You know, we have to be careful when we come to spirit without meekness, because that was not meekness. That was in condemnation and self-righteousness. Yes, it's pervasive too, Renee. Yeah. It's pervasive. I've talked to so many people, uh, women that are divorced, and it, it, I guess it's more uh, women that speak up on this, at least uh, the amount of stories that I've heard from women that are divorced that were cast out of their church. And some that the minute they find out you're divorced, they don't let you join a church because of that. You can't get baptized. Well, you can't teach. You you can't do. You can't hold any position in the church. Right. If you've been divorced. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move to uh, verse two uh, in the KJV. Says. This is for Sister Renee, I think, right? Yeah, that's correct. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Mm. Exactly. And this is clearly in reference, if a person is overtaken in a fault, it is a burden to that person. And we should see it as such. Not something to scold and beat up and look down on, but as a burden to carry. And so if you can help carry that with them and tell them you're going to be there, you're understanding, you, you know that God can help them through that. That's one thing. And that does fulfill the law of Christ because the law of Christ is love, love God, love others. That is the whole of the law. And so uh, I think this is clearly referencing the burden of sharing any burden that a brother might have whether it be he's overtaken in a fault or he's in pain or he's in financial or physical need, uh, emotional support, we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. And that, yeah. that is fulfilling the law of Christ. Amen. Amen. The law of Christ. That's, that's the law that, uh, that we should be focusing on. If anything, let me, uh, I'll read that in the Amplified. Amen. The law of faith, Crip. Yep. Okay. Uh, verse 2 in the Amplified says, Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ. That is, the law of Christian love. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the law that I believe that's referring to is, is uh, Jesus saying, uh, love God with everything. This is a paraphrase, not a direct quote. Love God with everything, your whole heart, mind, everything, every part of you. Uh, love God with, with all that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. And we can't do it, in my opinion. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Uh, try to take someone that's not saved. I'm not saying they can't be nice to people, but they don't really honestly love people through the love of, of, of God. They can't. They're not capable of it. Uh, but when we have the Holy Spirit in us, he, he gives us the ability to love others. And also, uh, and this gets convoluted stuff because it, uh, at least in the quote-unquote Christian world, it comes off as being selfish. But there's something there in that verse about in order to be able to love others, it, it's assumed that you love yourself. And how do you even love yourself when your heart is deceitfully wicked? That's because the Holy Spirit is in you, working in you, changing you. You love that part of yourself that's perfect, and that it's that same spirit that that we walk in with the help of the Holy Spirit. So that's how that's how we can do it. Uh, we're not ever going to be perfect at, uh, at anything while we carry these uh, flesh bodies around with us. But that's that's I, I believe that's what we should be uh, trying to attain. And the Holy Spirit walks with us on on that path uh, every day if we allow Him to. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, 
Now, I know that there are people who uh, are actually quite ambitious um, in, in spiritually. Um, and, and I'm not passing judgment whether that's good or, or not. Um, uh, but I, I think a person can um, uh, maybe be so concerned with, with trying to um, do all these things that we're, that we're, we're told to do, uh, walk in the spirit, and uh, meekness and, and uh, bear each other's burdens. And these are the things that we're, we're told that we should be doing uh, in the church. Um, and some people take this very seriously, but I think it's probably could be said that there, there's a rule that everything that's good can be taken from one extreme to another though. Mm -hmm. So you can even take something that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, Obviously, uh, especially if you're going to walk by, by the Spirit and, and uh, ser serve the, the church uh, of God, then uh, who would cr criticize that? But some people do things like that at the expense of other things, and they, and they get out of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, there are very famous uh, uh, pastors that uh, are, they're not only famous for their ministry, but they're famous for their failed families because their their wives and children were neglected because everything went into doing all these things. So uh, obviously we want to do all these things, um, but it's, it's, it's also could a very, poss very possible, maybe even likely that a person can obsess it's like a person with OCD that that everything they do is 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 is, is trying to make it too perfect, and they obsess and go too far with even something good like this. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed, and it's I easy. With exercise, you guys, they exercise until they're sick and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Something good turned extreme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, th I think a lot of people too, uh, in, in terms of ministry to, to back up your point, Luke, when, when they're, well, I've, I've, my ministry is the most important thing and they have a family. You're talking about uh, neglecting and uh, in many cases, uh, alienating um, uh, your, your children, for instance, or your wife, because you believe that your ministry is the most important thing, but what you're missing is, I believe, uh, God gave uh, marriage as a ministry, and that's that should be first. I mean, what good is your ministry if you're out there trying to, quote, unquote, save souls, uh, but there are members in your own family that are being neglected, and they're, they're not feeling your love. They're not feeling your compassion and your meekness. You're not coming alongside them in their own temptations and helping them. If we're supposed to help a brother like that, how much more are we supposed to help our, our family members? I've seen that happen a lot. Well, the, the idea of uh, Christian love, as it says in the Amplified, uh, that, that, that's the law of Christ, it, it, Christian love. Love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We talked about this last time, I think. And uh, in, in one way, you'd think, well, sure, boy, Jesus made it easy. Uh, you know, instead of 613 laws for Israel, he's saying, I'll sum it all up in these two things. Yeah. And, and that's the whole of the law. If you just do these two yeah. things, so on one hand you think, well, thanks. That's surely made it easy for us. But really, what's what's easier or harder here? Is it following a, a set of rules about how many steps you can take on the Sabbath before it's classified as work, or is it really loving your neighbor as yourself? Come on, raise your hand if you love your neighbor as yourself all the time. I mean, we, maybe we have moments of this kind of love for each other. But to, uh, this is we're supposed to be constant, constant love for each other, constant love for God, and and uh, if you if you say you have that uh, all the time, perfectly, then uh, I'll go back to the previous verse that talks about self righteousness and conceit. Amen. All right. Um, all right. Let's go to the next verse, verse three in the KJV. Uh, whose turn is it now? Crips? Uh, it's back to me. Okay. It says, for if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Yeah, I'm starting to see a theme here with Paul. Uh, and I, I think uh, he's pointing out conceit, as he mentioned above. 
uh, don't be conceited. Make sure and and um, when you're coming alongside someone, obviously uh, be careful of the temptation, but also the spirit of meekness. So this is this is uh, how Paul's directing us to be. And Paul makes this point in other uh, epistles too about don't think too high of yourself. I think I mentioned it earlier. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. It's not even saying Satan deceives you. You're deceiving yourself. Uh, so if you're if you're thinking you're all this, uh, if you're thinking you're this glow in the dark Christian and you're uh, higher than everybody else and, and you you've got it all figured out. Uh, uh, that's a mistake. You're not only a mistake, but a sin. You're deceiving yourself. Um, I think that's pr pretty clear. That's what he's talking about to me. Yep. All right, Renee, what do you say? Amen to that, Crips. I think he took the perfect context for this verse. It's still a continuing thought for restoring a brother that is overtaken in a fault with meekness. Uh, and if you think you're something, you you are deceived. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hear so many people still tell me that they have stopped sinning. And they have no idea how much our sin, uh, our flesh sins daily. Right. Just little ways we do. And they think themselves something. And it tells us in scripture that that Pharisee, trusted in himself that he was righteous and despised others. Yeah. And that's all it stirs up. Yep. Looking down on other people. So before you want to look down on the guy you're helping, don't think you're something. Yeah. Any way that uh, you help another, it is God that's bearing that burden. Mm -hmm. and, and we are just as able to fall. Never thank yourself. I, 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 it drives me crazy when I see something terrible on TV. Somebody's accused of murder or something. But I would never do that. How could somebody, you don't know what you do. Right. I people that were decent people get wrapped up in addiction and take them further than they ever wanted to go. And yeah. they drawing little lines in the sand and they'd step over it Yeah, further and further into darkness. But they think I, not me, I would never, they really, really cannot see just how human and how fallen and corrupt they are. They are Amen. no better than anyone else. Amen. And I think it's important uh, this verse, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And there is a balance to that because David talks about how is, who is man that thou art mindful of him? Like we're, we're nothing. We're dust. Why would God even care about us? And that's one sense. Matter of fact, it says the whole nations aren't even dust on a scale. Like the power of a nation doesn't even move the scale in regards to God. But at the same time, we are precious to him. We need to know we're precious to him, not because we're good, but because he is. Uh, but we should never think it's something in us. Yeah. And that's another thing in Calvinism that drives me crazy. They try to say it's unconditional election, yet they look to themselves to see if they're persevering in good enough works. And they really think they're chosen because they're, there's something in them. They all really think they're one of the elect because there's something in them. And that is why that one doctrine is so despicable to me. If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And I like what Cripp said. It's not even Satan deceiving you. He's yeah. deceiving your own self. Same thing John said. So a man says he has not sinned, he deceived himself. And the truth isn't on him. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that that uh, everyone blames Satan or blames demons for their behavior when it, it, it's it's clear in Scripture that without God, without the Holy Spirit, our heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Is what That's it right. Says. So uh, we we don't have to worry about Satan. Uh, we have enough problem with ourselves if we're not uh, going to be careful. Amen. All right, uh, I'd like to read it in the Amplified. Verse 3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something special, when in fact he is nothing special except in his own eyes, 
he deceives himself. Yeah, there are, uh, there is a lot of delusion that I've observed in the world. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing that really always stood out to me is I used to watch that uh, singing show, American Idol, and I'd watch all these people audition for it. And about 95% of the people sing is even as bad as I do. They're horrible. Oh, yeah. And, and there was, there's some great singers, but the vast majority, here they are going on these auditions, and some of them are just having some fun and know they're no good, but there's a lot of people who are really deluded. They actually believe that they are one of the, the greatest singer in the world, yeah. and uh, maybe they have a mother that could never criticize them, so they all, like my mother always told us, we are great singers, because my mother did nothing but praise us. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I, I have my own ears, and I know that none of us in my family can sing, so... Uh, but these people are so deluded thinking that they're really great singers and they're crushed when they're told the truth. Uh, but whether it's that or just uh, other places in life that uh, people are suffering from these delusions, delusions of grandeur. And, and we see it all the time with the Lordship heresy that there are all these people that they actually think that they are all that. They really got their act together. God is certainly pleased with them. Oh, yeah. It's just like that, really, Renee, you mentioned it, and I, 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 I wish I had mentioned it first because it's one of my favorite parts of the Bible is the Pharisee praying at the, at the temple and, uh, and, and the publican. And, and here he is looking around, disdaining everybody and thinking he is so fantastic and looking down on everybody else. So um, really, that, that's it. We, I think we can learn pretty much almost all, all we need to learn from that example comparing those two yeah all right shall we go to the next verse i'll just add one thing uh, brother Luke, that you just said yeah and what what is the what is the guy in that uh verse doing he's comparing himself to someone else uh the benchmark is god that's all you have to you know that's all you have to focus on is is the benchmark the level of perfection which we cannot attain is god uh, anyone else, if you're focused on anyone else, then your focus is in the wrong place. He's saying, thank you, God, that I'm not like this sinner. Uh, he's comparing himself to someone else rather than to God. That's all. Yeah, that's a good, very important point. So I want to talk about it. Thank you. Um, the, 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 the Bible does say that no one is good, uh, not even one. Um, and Jesus even said, when the rich young ruler called him good, good sir, good master, whatever, he, he said, why do you call me good? Don't you know that only God is good? So the implication is, are you referring to me as God? Do you understand who I am? Or, but so I, I think that the word good and the word God is really the same word. I mean, look at this, the spelling of it. Um, and if only God is good, the way the scripture tells us, then good and God are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. and so therefore, I, you can't say you're good because that would make you God. Uh, so I, I probably would be better understood to use the word, uh, interpret the word good as perfect. No one is perfect and no, no one is good uh, but by God's standards. Uh, now, we all have relative goodness, though, and that's what the problem is. When people compare themselves to each other, they think that they're pretty good relatively. Um, obviously, there are some people who are better than me, but I'm a pretty darn good person. So it, when you look at it like that, then you can you know, start getting all full of yourself and puffed up like that Pharisee. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, even... Uh, um, as much as they tried to, to do it all right, Jesus said, your, your righteousness must exceed the Pharisees. <laughs> yeah. As hard as they're trying and working real hard to be perfect, yeah. uh, you're, you're, they, they're not, that's not enough. And uh, so, uh, uh, and, but really the test, as you said, brother, is uh, instead of comparing ourselves to each other where we, we might be relatively good or bad, right. uh, we have, the comparison is really to Christ. And that, that's why the scripture says that we all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, 
Mm. And I believe the glory of God was uh, established uh, with the life of Jesus. He, he gave us an example and said, this is the standard. This is what you have to match. Yep. If you can live a life as perfectly as I lived it, then you don't need me. <laughs> right. But uh, we, the Bible says we all fall short of that. No one's able to do it. So that for therefore we recognize our need for him. For him. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Uh, any more, or should we move to the next verse? No, that's good. He filled that in pretty well. All right. Uh, the next verse in the KJV verse four says, "But ever let every man prove his own work." And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Yeah. It's it Renee's it? turn, though. Renee? Yeah, uh, Jason, both of you guys were talking about this earlier, judging other people's walk. Yeah. So I, I like this. Let every man prove his own work. Mm -hmm. Then shall he have rejo rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Uh, so I, I think this is, it's not saying uh, to be proud of yourself. It, it's more saying, worry about your own walk. Like um, let every man prove his own work and then shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Yes. Um, I, I think this more says uh, let's let's not judge other people in that in a condemning way uh, because again this is continuing about a brother being overtaken in a fault. Let's see it for what it is. It's something that's trying to destroy him, and we're trying to help him, but also don't get puffed up uh, because you have the same weakness. Um, it, it's is I think it's just about balancing helping others, uh, being part of the Christian community without, uh, it's so quick for humanity to get puffed up in himself. And we know that's what Satan fell for his own pride. So I think there's a lot of warnings against that. And I think that's what that's talking about here. Worrying about your own, uh, work, not another's. Amen. All right. Uh, uh, let me read that in the Amplified before you comment, Brother Cripps. It says, sure. but each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, that is, examining his actions, attitudes, and behavior, and then he can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. Wow. Wow, isn't that kind of just what we're what we're talking about? On uh, the uh, the publican comparing himself to to other people and and judging by that uh, uh, benchmark rather than what he should be doing, which is looking at God. Yeah, uh, uh, Renee did a good job of explaining this. There's not a whole lot I can add to it except uh, to say that this is this is perfect. Um, uh, let every man prove his own work. Yeah, so focus on focus on what you're doing rather than uh, focusing on what someone else is doing. Uh, if you're focusing on yourself and your relationship with God, your own walk, then you shouldn't have time because there should be enough work for you to do in yourself uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't have time to be poking, pointing the finger at someone else. You're worried about you. And then, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I believe as you mature and as you grow in Him, uh, uh, and and you focused on yourself, and he's changing you and producing fruit in you. Uh, then, if God points someone out to you, uh, like like Paul's talking about, someone that's overtaken in a fault, then of course take the time to to encourage them and and to spend time in the Word or whatever it is the Holy Spirit leads you to do. And you're you're able to do that because you have uh, taken the time to examine yourself uh, first. Uh, I, I think this is great. It's a, it, it's a, uh, it's a point that we should all take and think about and consider, uh, if we're doing this, then it also, uh, to me, it ties into the, uh, the law of Christ, you know, the, the law of love, uh, uh, focusing in on God first. And then 
you'll have the ability to love your neighbors yourself. This is loving yourself. And this is, the, again, people twist it up and think, think it's talking about um, being selfish. Uh, to me, it's not being selfish at all, uh, what Paul's saying. He's saying, prove your own work. Worry about your own work. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing that, then it sets you up in, uh, in, into a place to be able to then help someone else. It's the whole analogy of the mask. That you're, if anyone's ever taken a, a, a plane flight and they're at the front and they're, uh, they're going over, you know, if, if, in, in the, uh, if you lose uh, cabin pressure, the mask will drop down from above. Fix your own mask first before helping your neighbor or the person next to you with their mask. And the reason for that is because if you don't, if, if you're not able to breathe and you're trying to help someone else breathe, uh, you, you, you could be in real trouble. So it's not saying don't help other people. It's saying worry about yourself first and then you can help others. Brother Luke, I, I also want to say, because it sounds kind of confusing. I think I get what it's saying here. I think it, it's like uh, worry about your, your own, like he said, your own work be realistic about your own failures and your own attributes. That way your view of yourself will be based on something realistic and in humility rather than a comparison of yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. You won't get an air of superiority and you won't feel all shrunken down. That way it's this rejoicing in yourself and not in another. It's like, don't uh, use others to puff yourself up every the way you look at yourself and your own works should be uh realistic knowing your own personal virtues and failures mm -hmm. i think that that's what it's it means in rejoicing in yourself and not in another mm -hmm. Woohoo! beautiful i loved how you stated that kind of summed up everything here in that one last statement um let me see. I'm not sure. I guess we don't really have time to go to another verse. What what number was that? Five? No, that was uh, that was four. So we'll pick up with verse five next time. And let me see. There's only uh, eighteen verses, so there's there's thirteen verses left. And then we need to do uh, when we finish this, do a um, kind of a uh, not only a summary of the night, but we need to do a, sum a summary and a review of the entire book, uh, conforming our conclusions uh, for uh, bef before we move on to Ephesians. We'll do that next week. Uh, so matter of fact, I'll give you a heads up since I'm gonna ask everybody to, to kind of give a, a, uh, your conclusions on the, on the whole book of Galatians uh, at the end of the study next time. Um, so um, by the way, Ben, I, I didn't see you uh, interject with our new, um, uh, method. Uh, no, there was nothing uh, that you could could do with that tonight. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't see. I, I, this is. Uh, there's some books in the Bible that where I've really gone deep into and uh, really kind of looked at the Greek behind it, and that, that's what you wanted me to talk about. Is if there's any Greek nuggets, um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there probably is. I just haven't uh, done that for this particular book. Um, Ephesians for sure. Uh, there will be. Uh, there's some really awesome nuggets there. I think everyone will like. Um, so stay tuned. I guess. <laughs> Between Galatians and Ephesians, you can't even find a white spot on my book on my Bible. Like there's so much highlighted and writing all in my Bible on Ephesians and Galatians. You can't. You can't even read them. Wow. It's, it's awesome. I loved how Cripps mentioned the uh, the air mask, like worrying about yourself. Yeah. It is yeah. true. You cannot help anybody until you're you've got a healthy focus of self. A, a healthy focus. Not I need to I need to confess right. my sin right now. I'm sorry. I feel really convicted, uh, Sister Renee. I'm jealous, envious of your Bible with all its notes. Oh gosh. Oh no. <laughs> It's, it, it's, I really, uh, this is the truth. I, uh, it's probably one of my very biggest regrets in my life is that I didn't ever mark up my Bible the way you just said. Um, when I see people who have all the verses of the Bible, some kind of notes and, and, and uh, references, uh, I always wish I had started doing that. But 34 years later, I have no notes in my Bible. Almost, almost. You better get to it. I keep one pristine. 
and I don't use it that often. I keep that here and out. And then I have mine in my, my car that I keep zipped up. And so in church, I always have it and I'm writing all in it. But I do have one that I, I keep clean so that I can actually see it. Wow. You better get on it. I, I'm I'm chastising you, brother Luke. You better get on it. You better start marking that Bible up. <laughs> I'm afraid the sand in the hourglass is uh, getting low. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> if I can still, if, if I'm not sure how much I can accomplish now. If I can still hear you and there's blood still pumping those brains in their uh, brains, there's blood still pumping in your veins, and uh, uh, you, you you have time. <laughs> I also in my brains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that blood getting to your brain, brother Luke? Is it, is it working all right? Oh, uh, all right. Let's start giving our uh, closing remarks here. But uh, um, I hinted at it earlier. Uh, but uh, I called, uh, I told Ben earlier today. I, what do you think of this idea? Is that we we're in the Wednesday study? We're looking at each verse in the KJV, and then sometimes we look at it in other translations. Uh, but uh, we don't take any time to really look at it in the Greek. Uh, and I don't want to do that routinely, like every verse we look at in the Greek. It, it would be too laborious, I believe. But I asked him, I said, if you could check in the Greek as we're going through it, and if you uh, see that a verse every once in a while has something in you see in the Greek that is really profound that we need we need to know about, then you can bring it to our attention. So that's what uh, I've asked Ben if he could do that, and hopefully, uh, as we go on, he'll discover some uh, some of the verses as we go forward where uh, the, there's something in the Greek that might make a big difference in the way we understand the verse. Amen. Uh, all right, so Ben, let me ask you to go first. Give us your thoughts on the, the discussion tonight. Uh, I thought it was awesome. You guys, it was perfect. Uh, uh, you guys, a lot of good uh, exposition on this uh, particular chapter. Um, and with regards to the Greek, um, or actually what I wanted to say, uh, with regards to notes, if anyone, if you're a new Christian, or even anyone who, who's even uh, been a Christian for a long time, I would highly, highly recommend that you uh, take notes. And uh, I think a good way to do it, frankly, is do it electronically. So one thing I do uh, all the time now, I started this about three years ago. I've always taken notes. That's always a good idea. Uh, I use like a, a program called OneNote. It's just an electronic uh, 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 note-taking program that allows you to organize things. And you can paste images into it. And it can read the text off the images. And uh, it can transcribe uh, uh, audio and things like that. It's got a lot of powerful things. Uh, with it. Um, if you paste something from the web, for example, it'll automatically cite where it was taken from, like the exact link it was pulled from. Uh, so I did that for many years, but now what I've been doing over the last probably three years, which has really made a difference, is um, I'll take the, uh, I'll go to Bible Gateway, it's my favorite, uh, and I'll print out uh, my, I like the New King James, but I, I look at all of them. Uh, but I like the New King James, um, and I'll print, I'll, uh, I'll copy that into like a Word document, like a Microsoft Word document or any word processing document. And then uh, in, in between each verse, I'll, I'll put commentary, things that I've discovered or, you know, sideline notes or other commentaries. And over time, it it's really uh, elevated my level of understanding so much more because there's things I, I forget about. And um, I'll go back to it and just make another connection or, or enrich an, an understanding that I already have. So if you haven't done that, I would highly recommend it because it, I'm just always shocked. I used to say to myself all the time, oh, I won't forget that. I won't forget that. I'm a young guy. I won't forget it. Well... Um, I'm not so young anymore, first of all, and even, even when I was young, I would still forget much more than I, I was too optimistic about what I could remember. Um, so I, that's something I'd highly recommend. And yes, um, I'm not a Greek expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I do like, uh, I do read a lot of commentaries, um, from people who do go deeper into the Greek and it, it does amplify it. Um, for just understanding the different tenses and moods, for example, um, one word might make, mean something like, okay. This happened in the past, and it has an, in, an indefinite time span, or it happened in the past, and it has continuing results forever. And that really helps you um, understand, like, the word, like, sometimes the word saved, it means, like, it means temporal salvation or eternal. Understanding that Greek a lot of times can reveal which, which that person is referring to, if they're referring to both or just one or the other, it'd be all kinds of things like that. Um, a lot of good stuff, and, and especially in Ephesians, there's a lot of good ones, so... Uh, I think you'll, I think I'll have an opportunity to share some of that uh, next week. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you, brother. Um, appreciate you taking that on uh, along with everything else you're doing. Um, all right. Uh, brother Cripps, why don't you give us your uh, summary thoughts? Yeah, summary thoughts. It was a great, uh, great study tonight. And uh, I agree with Ben. There's a lot of good exposition from uh, everyone else. And uh, again, this is just, it's edifying to me to do these, uh, to do these studies. I don't know what I'd do without it. Uh, it, it, it helps me every week to have at least, uh, I mean, I do it more than once a week of Bible study and, and all that, but to do it with you guys uh, has been, it has helped my walk in me focusing on myself rather than everybody else and focus on what I'm doing. And, uh, that's what I take out of, out of tonight's what Paul's saying. Uh, uh, good work. If I, if I'm critiquing myself, doesn't mean I'm there. I have to continue to do that because I'm, as long as, uh, I'm breathing and I still have blood going through my brains, uh, <laughs> then, uh, I'm, I'm still, uh, I still have a lot to learn and a long way to go. I'm, I've never arrived anywhere. Uh, and I believe uh, that we can all take to heart the way Paul is saying that we're supposed to come alongside uh, someone, someone else and the kind of attitude that we should have. That's challenging. It's hard to do that, especially in today's world with a, with a lot of people that uh, seem to get angry if you try to help them. You know, if you if you point something out, uh, they're pretty quick uh, to to snap at you. Uh, they don't like that. They they don't respond as the Bible says they should respond when being corrected by a uh, a brother or sister, you know, you sh- you should be appreciative of that. Um, but if you're coming across as as uh, egotistical and arrogant, uh, of course someone's going to react to that. If you're not doing it in a spirit of meekness, if you if you come alongside someone and 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 try to point something out, and you're in the spirit of meekness, and they react, then that's on them. But if you if you uh, do it the opposite way of what Paul says, um, then you 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 have to uh, look at your uh, your mode. Uh, how how you're uh, operating in that. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it was a great study. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to finishing up and and moving on to uh, the next uh, book, but this has been a great book. So, um, and I just want to say briefly about the Greek and I'm glad uh, Ben uh, expressed it like he did with the different tenses and stuff, because I, I've seen uh, a lot of, a lot of other people that get excited about looking in the Greek and, and proofreading with the uh, KJV or other versions. And uh, they have really no understanding uh, of the different tenses and things. And I, I've, I've seen a lot of people um, uh, uh, think that they, you know, read a couple uh, Greek translations or read a couple words and that uh, saw how it's translated. And then they, they think that they uh, understand it completely. You just have to be very careful. And I'm, I'm glad Ben has that attitude. That was good. Amen. All right, Sister Renee, uh, let me hear your summary and what's your plan for tomorrow? Yeah, okay. Well, I I love the We actually didn't get to too many verses, and I like that because I think we need to spend time on sometimes when they're a little confusing and we're reading alone, we kind of pass by them and go, oh, we'll come back to that. So it's good that we uh, study the verses that might not seem that compelling until you really look into them and they're they're important. Uh, so I really enjoyed the study. Um, I wanted to pray for Michael McGregor and his mom, for Hendrix and his dad. He's having blood work. And for MG. MG is looking for work. He needs a job. Um, we've been praying for a little while for him, but I want to ask everyone to continually lift him up because God will provide for his children. So uh, please ask God to... Uh, uh, provide some work for MG. I know how stressful that can be, especially in this climate. Uh, tomorrow night, I'm not doing the throwdown. Uh, I have Jim started school this week and I have an early medical thing Friday morning. Uh, so I'm going to pick it up next week. I might make it up, Richard. I might make it up Saturday. I can't promise, but I, I might make it up Saturday. Good for you, Richard. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but we'll talk about something. Last time we had an open topic and it worked uh, great. I don't know if you saw it, Crips. We had Daryl on there. Yeah, I watched it. Yep. Oh, good, good. Yep. Yeah, it, it was just a, a good conversation uh, just to talk about what's on our hearts. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed I it. Look forward to our Bible studies on Wednesday.
I mean, I always learn something from you guys. I always see it in another way between you guys and those in the chat. And I was happy to see that on average, we have between 40 and 43 people tonight at the study. And that's really good. I had a couple of new viewers to my channel that joined us tonight. And I hope that you will join us again. Uh, it's a great way to study and grow in the word. It really is. And to learn these scriptures in context so that they can't be used to condemn you, but instead should edify you and encourage you to serve the Lord and abide in his loving grace. Amen. I was really happy to see you all tonight. God bless. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. And I want to thank Ben for producing it again. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, you know, before we started, uh, we were wondering if we were going to get through it and, and have extra time. <laughs> and I thought, no, we we probably won't even get halfway through it. Some, it's not unusual for us to spend the 90 minutes only doing maybe eight or 10 verses sometimes. So uh, I do think, though, that the remainder of the verses, we probably will be able to finish uh, next Wednesday and uh, have some time left to do our, our conclusions. So everybody be prepared for that on mm -hmm. next Wednesday. Um, and then after that, we'll move on to the book of Ephesians, which obviously we love all them all. And definitely every time we come to one, we the next one's we're really anticipating it because it's so exciting. Each one of them is so beautiful. <clears throat> um, oh, uh, I, the, uh, Ben and uh, Renee and Cripps, uh, if you don't have to run off, I like to talk to everybody for like five minutes before our, before we uh, we finish for tonight after we're sure. live program. Um, other than that, uh, thank you everybody in the chat room for participating uh, and uh the study was a lot of fun, and we all learn every t single time we get together. So uh, uh, what a blessing to, to be able to have others who love to talk about Jesus in the Bible, how blessed we are. Thank you all. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus. Mm.